Well, about eight or nine years ago, I find myself unable to go to sleep at night. I can't sleep, my mind's racing. I'm stressed about a bunch of different things that are going on in my world and a trauma that had happened in our family and church and work and just all kind of mixed together. And so I, I couldn't sleep. Um, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. I, it was just, it was bad. And one of those nights I, I found myself unable to literally breathe. Like I felt like someone was standing on my chest. My chest was caving in. I was literally grabbing the, the sheets and turning them in my bed, just trying to get a breath. The next day I was running and um, as I was running, I just began to sob. I came home and sat just sobbing on the living room floor. And my wife walked in and freaked out. She's wondering what's going on. And I didn't know what was going on. I'd never been through this before. I'd never had any of these things happen to me before. And come to find out I was dealing with anxiety and having anxiety attacks and, and panic attacks. Maybe you've been in a similar place. Now you might be thinking, but aren't you a pastor? Like don't pastors like not deal with that stuff? Like they don't, they don't struggle with things that like, right. I mean, your, your, y'all's life, your, your life's like, it's all good and it's all put together and nice. And like, you've got everything together and nothing could be further from the truth. Listen, I am just as messed up as you are. And I have no problem saying you're messed up because I know I'm messed up. And because Jesus came and said, he came for those who know they are sick. In other words, Jesus came for people who know they're messed up, who know they're broken and in need of a savior who know they're sick and they need a, a doctor to help them and to fix them and to put them back together. And so as a Christian, that's our, <laughs> that's our creed. We are messed up, broken people in need of a savior. So there's no room for, for pride in any of us, but sure. I struggle with things and this has been something I've struggled with ever since I struggle with anxiety. And so I have to manage that and watch that and, and pray about that. It's a, it's a regular thing in my life. And it was for a lot of the spiritual giants that we read about in the scripture. Moses struggled with anxiety and stress so much so that he didn't want to get out of bed. He didn't want to get out of his tent. And his father-in-law Jethro comes in and says, Hey man, you, you've got to figure this out. You need a different system here because this is not working for you. You've got millions of people coming directly to you with every single one of their problems and, and you can't handle it on your own. So you need some help. You need to put in some other judges and other leaders like to take the load off of your shoulders. But Moses, who led Israel out of slavery to the Egyptians battled with anxiety and the pressure, the burden of leading all of these people. King David battled with, as we read the Psalms, the scholars think that David battled with anxiety, uh, probably bouts of depression often. He was constantly at war. He lost an infant child. Some of you can relate. And when you read through the Psalms, it, it reads like someone who really struggles with some dark things, dark thoughts. Someone who battled with depression and anxiety. Elijah, right after Mount Carmel, right after this huge victory when God sends fire down from heaven and consumes this altar that, that he had soaked in water and he defeats the prophets of, of Baal right after this. I mean, not a scene later and Elijah is asking God to take his life. He says, I'm done. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of the stress, the pressure, standing up to all this idolatry. And he's literally asking God to take him out. Just wipe me out. Just take my life. He's ready to be done. Jeremiah, the prophecies, the truth that Jeremiah had to speak to the people of Israel and Judah were so strong and harsh because of the impending judgment that was to come. Obviously, the people didn't like what he had to say, and so they beat him for it. They imprisoned him for it. He dealt with a lot of anxiety and pressure of delivering very bad news to God's people, and they hated him for it. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1 that he often felt so overwhelmed, he felt like he would literally die. Jesus, the only perfect one in the entire list, all the rest of them and us are all broken and messed up and sinful. Jesus, the perfect son of God in the garden of Gethsemane is praying and he says, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. My soul, some translations is so grieved 
that we learn that Jesus actually sweat drops of blood. He was so overwhelmed. He was so grieved in his spirit, yet Jesus was without sin. So you can be spiritual and battle with overwhelming thoughts and temptations and still not be in sin. I mean, that's what we learned from Jesus. Jesus was overwhelmed, he said, in my soul to the point of death, but Jesus was perfect. He was without sin. And see, this totally debunks the idea that as followers of Jesus, if you're blessed and highly favored, that you're not going to experience trouble or strife or struggle or anxiety or depression in this life. That's not, nothing could be further from the truth. One of the greatest preachers ever was a guy by the name of Charles Spurgeon. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He was a famous preacher in the 1800s. He struggled with depression most of his life. In fact, most people say it never really went away. He was so depressed. The elders in his church would literally physically pick him up off the front pew of a church and take him up to the, the, uh, the, the lectern so where he could preach even through and in the midst of his depression. And he did that most of his life. He battled depression most of his life, yet God used him in a mighty way in spite of it and even through it. So nothing could be further from the truth if you're blessed, if you're favored, that you won't struggle, that you won't deal with anxiety or even depression or, or fear or pressure. And these feelings are common to all of us. And I think if we had the genie, like the genie in a bottle, the genie in the lamp that we could rub and it would come out and ask us for three wishes. Most of us would wish for things like unlimited money, power, good looks, the perfect relationship, like the perfect guy or girl, because we think if we have those things, we're blessed and we're favored with these things and with this right set of circumstances, then we won't battle with fear or oppression or anxiety or depression or any of those things. We won't have to deal with that if we have all of those things. If we could have our wish, we wouldn't deal with these things. But that's not reality. We do battle with these thoughts and feelings, with the pressure, with fear, with anxiety. Oftentimes trauma or prolonged stress leads to anxiety and prolonged bouts of anxiety will lead to having anxiety attacks or it's ugly cousin depression. So what do we do? How do we deal in these moments? Like, what do we do? How do we respond? Let's go back to Psalm 46. If you have your Bible, you can turn there, uh, go on our app. Uh, the City Church Lubbock, download that in your app store, click sermon notes, follow along with us. The verses and the points are all there. You can fill in the blank as we go. And so it'll help you kind of actively engage and stay involved and participate if you're filling in those blanks. And then you can email it to yourself when we're done here in a little bit. Let's go. Psalm 46. This is the basis for this series. We're there last week. We'll be here today a little bit. We'll be there next week again. But let's go. Psalm 46, starting in verse 1. It says this, this is what we saw last week. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So God's our place of safety and our source of power. We saw that last week and he's always ready to help. He wants to help us in our times of trouble. So not always from trouble, but always in trouble. God wants to help us. Verse two, here's what we'll see today. So because of this, because of what we said last week, so we will not fear when earthquakes come. So we will not fear when the earthquakes come, not if they come, but when they come, when the earth quakes, because it's going to happen and it's going to happen in your life and in my life. When the earthquakes come, you don't have to fear, the psalmist said. And make no mistake, it's not if, it's when. And so you may be there now, but if you're not there now, you probably just got out of it. And if, you're not there, if you didn't just get out of it and you're not there now, chances are the earthquake is coming. Jesus said, that's life. He could have said, instead of saying, you'll go through many troubles in this life, you'll go through many earthquakes in this life. But when you do, you don't have to. To fear. Now here in West Texas, we haven't really been through many earthquakes. Okay. But we do get tornadoes and every once in a while we get some sort of tornado apocalypse, I guess, where all these tornadoes are going to converge into like one massive tornado. And when that happens, our entire city goes into a panic attack and shuts down. It's absolute madness here when we think the tornado apocalypse is coming for us. Right. I mean, we are overcome with fear. You could say it another way. We are overcome with 
anxiety, when the earthquake comes, when the tornado is headed our way, when it's coming down, when it's bearing down and we know it's coming for us, we're overcome with fear, anxiety. And in an earthquake, you literally feel like the ground is buckling and moving beneath you. You feel like everything around you is moving and shaking and everything's falling in on top of you and there's nothing that you or anyone else can do about it and that's a lot like anxiety. You feel like everything beneath you is moving and shifting and breaking. Everything around you is crumbling. Your world is crumbling. It's falling in on top of you and there is nothing that you can do. You can't control it. You can't change it. You are absolutely helpless in an earthquake, and that's a lot like anxiety. That sounds a lot like being overcome with fear, with the pressure. Peter said this in 1 Peter 5 about anxiety. He said this, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand. Okay, we're gonna go back through this and then we're all gonna say these four words together. Okay, under God's mighty hand. You ready? You ready to participate? Some of you are like, no, I'm not ready. Okay, you can get some more coffee, then you can come back and participate. All right, so ready, here we go. Humble yourselves, therefore. Good job, y'all have had, y'all 1130 though, y'all have had a lot of coffee already. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Watch this, cast all your anxiety on him, on God, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Isn't it interesting that in talking about anxiety, Peter says your enemy, the devil, is looking for someone to devour. Almost as if it's in that moment of anxiety and fear and pressure that the devil has you at a weak spot where he could take you out and ruin your life. And how many of us have been there before at that low moment and you got a choice. You can either run from God, be mad at God, be bitter at towards God, or you humble yourself under the hand of God and you seek God like you never have before in your life because you know, I need help. I'm in trouble and I need help. You got a decision to make, but you need to know when you face anxiety, when you're going through a time of of trouble, when you're overcome with fear, that's a moment when the devil's gonna try to take you out. And so Peter says at that moment, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, cast all your anxiety on him. Now here's what you need to know about these verses. In English, in our Bibles, this is two sentences. You see it ends with here in due time and then another sentence starts and it ends with you. In the Greek New Testament, in the original language, in the Greek manuscripts, these first two sentences are one sentence. It's one sentence. And they're two dependent thoughts, not one or two independent thoughts. They're one thought. And these two things depend on each other in the Greek language. In other words, here's what Peter's saying. In order to cast all your anxiety on God, you have to come under the hand of God. It's a dependent thought. This is one sentence. It's one idea that Peter's trying to communicate here that you don't cast your anxiety upon God because he cares for you. That's not possible unless you come under the mighty hand of God. So what does that mean? What does that look like? What does it mean? What does it look like to come under the mighty hand of God? Well, in the Bible, the hand of God represents many things. And we're going to see four of them today. The hand of God in the Bible represents many things. We're going to look at four. Number one, the hand of God represents the plan of God. In the scripture, oftentimes the hand of God represents the plan of God. When God delivered Israel from bondage, from slavery to the Egyptians, he takes them with Moses as their leader to the edge of the Red Sea. Well, when they get to the edge of the sea, what happens? They begin to hear the Egyptians coming after them. They begin to hear and literally feel the earth quaking underneath them as the soldiers and as the chariots are approaching them. And they begin to freak out because they're overcome with fear and anxiety about what's about to happen. And here's what they do. In the middle of their anxiety and their fear, they begin to say things like this. We were better off in slavery to the Egyptians. We should just go back. Moses, what have you done? You and God, you've just led us out here to die. That's what you did, right? In other words, here's what they're saying. God, you had no plan. 
You've been caught off guard by our situation. You don't have a plan to get us out of this. You got us out of slavery. Yeah, great, good, thanks. But now you've just brought us here to die. You have no plan. And they begin to say, we were better off. We should just go back. How many times, how many times have you ever felt like that? Man, this isn't worth it. I should just go back. I should just quit because this isn't worth it. God doesn't know what he's doing. He led me out here to die. Well, as they're grumbling, God says to Moses, take that staff in your hand and lift it up in the air. And Moses takes his staff in his hand and he raises it, he lifts it up, the waters part, they walk through on dry ground, the Egyptian shoulders come and the water comes down on top of them, wipes out the army, they get on the other side and here's what they began to say for generation after generation after generation, God saved us by his mighty hand. It wasn't Moses' hand. They didn't say Moses saved us by his mighty hand. No, they said as Moses put that staff in his hand and he lifted up in his, into the air and the waters began to part, what they would say for thousands of years later and even to this day, they would say God delivered us with an outstretched arm and with his mighty hand. God delivered us, he saved us by his mighty hand. So the hand of God often represents the plan of God. Number two, the hand of God often in the Bible represents the provision of God. The hand of God often represents or stands for the provision of God. Have you ever felt like, especially when you're anxious or, or fearful or when the pressure's on, I can't do it. I, I'm not enough. I don't have what it takes to do what needs to be done. Well, when the crowds were around Jesus as he would speak to them and preach to them, there were times in scripture and when we were reading the gospels that Jesus would wanna feed thousands of people all at one time. And he told his disciples, you give them something to eat. And they're like, what? There's thousands of people here. We don't have what it takes. We don't have enough to feed all of these people. And what does Jesus say? Well, tell me, you know, basically, what do you, what do you have? What do you have? And they're like, well, we got these loaves and these fishes. And basically, in my translation of what Jesus said, here's what he said, okay? Bring it to me. Give me what you got. And so they bring to Jesus what they do have and they put it in his hands and he prays, he blesses it and he begins to break it and he begins to share it and give it out. And not only do they have everything they need to feed this crowd, they have more than enough. There's extra food left over. When they put their not enough into the hands of Jesus, he multiplied it and he provided the food that was needed to feed all of these people. You know, oftentimes our culture will tell us when we're stressed, when we're anxious, when we're feeling the pressure, you are enough. So go find yourself, center yourself, get to know yourself, harness yourself and your energy and your chi and all that kind of stuff because you're enough. And if you will just realize you're enough and center yourself and find yourself and be yourself, then you'll be okay. And I think that's terrible news. It's terrible advice. And we don't find it anywhere in the scripture because it's hopeless. The Bible actually says we're not enough. The Bible actually says no one's good, no, not one. You're not enough, I hate to break it to you. I'm not enough, I don't have what it takes. And that's the creed, that's the cry of the Christian. I can't do it, I need a savior, I need a rescuer, I need someone to help me because I can't do it. I am not enough. And that's good news. It's good news because when I realize that I'm not enough, that I'm broken, that I'm in need, 
and I humble myself under the hand of God, God provides, he multiplies and he takes my not enough and he turns it into way more than enough. That's why Paul said, Christ in you is your hope of glory. You aren't your hope of glory. Christ in you is your hope of glory. You can't do all things, but in Christ, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So make no mistake, you're not enough, you'll never be enough. Finding yourself, centering yourself, it's not gonna help you. It's a hopeless cause. You need to find Jesus. You need to ask Jesus for help. And he'll take your not enough and he'll multiply it and turn it into way more than enough. Third, the hand of God often represents the protection of God. The hand of God often represents the protection of God. Some of you are familiar with the story of Peter seeing Jesus walk on the water and Peter sees him do it. And he's like, oh, that's pretty cool. I want to do the same thing. And, and Jesus says, come, come, you know, come to me. And Peter gets out and he begins to walk on water to Jesus. But what begins to happen is he takes his eyes off Jesus because he starts feeling the wind and he starts feeling the, the waves beneath him. He starts feeling the storm like we all do sometimes. And he takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink. Well, when he begins to sink, he cries out to his Lord, save me. And the scripture says immediately Jesus grabbed Peter. In other words, Jesus offered him his hand. Peter was sinking. He cried out to be saved and Jesus grabbed him with his hand. You see, Peter was sinking, but he wasn't sunk. And the whole time he was always in the grip of his savior, Jesus. Even in the storm, even when he was sinking, he was always in Jesus's grip. And when he cried out, Lord, save me, even though he was sinking, he wasn't sunk. And he cried out and Jesus offered him his hand. And Peter was saved. The hand of God often represents the protection of God. And then finally, the hand of God often represents the propitiation of God. Now you're like, okay, plan. That's an easy word. Okay. Um, protection. I get that provision a little bit bigger, but I understand that this I'm guessing most of us don't know what this word means, or we haven't heard it in probably 50 years. It used to be in our Bibles. But as we've gotten translations that are easier to understand, we've used different words. But the hand of God often represents the propitiation of God. So let me, let me, explain, let me explain this real quick. After Jesus had risen from the grave, he starts appearing to the disciples and they tell one of the other disciples, Thomas, he's, he's risen. The Lord's alive. And Thomas doesn't believe. And Thomas says this, he says, I won't believe until I see the wounds in his hands. So later Jesus appears to the disciples again, one of his many times that he appeared to them alive after his death. And he appears to them and knowing what was in Peter's heart, knowing the doubt, the questions that, was, that were in Peter's heart, Jesus shows up and he immediately says to Thomas, he says, Thomas, come see my hands touch them and see the wounds that are in my hands. Touch my side and see where they pierced me with the spear. And Thomas touches the hands of Jesus where the nails were put. And he sees that it is Jesus. It is him, but he's been risen from the grave. He puts his hands in the nail wounds in his hands. Like he puts his hands in Jesus's hands where the nails had been put. And I wonder if in that moment, John instantly thought of Isaiah 53, where it said the Messiah would be pierced for our transgressions. He would be bruised, he would be whipped, he would be beaten for our iniquity, for our sin. And that he would take the judgment and the wrath of God for sin upon himself for us in our place. I wonder if John touching the nailed scarred hands of Jesus instantly thought of Isaiah 53, that he would be pierced for our transgression. 
And he would die in our place for our sin. The perfect spotless lamb of God. And the old covenant, you had to offer your perfect spotless lamb to be the propitiation for your sin, to atone for your sin, to be the sacrifice in your place for your sin. And when you offered the lamb, you would put your hand on the lamb saying and recognizing this animal, this lamb is going to die in my place for my sin for me. I deserve to die because the curse of sin is death. God said so in Genesis three. The curse of sin is death. Paul said it like this, the wages of sin is death. And so they would put their hand on the animal like that lamb and they would say, this lamb, this animal is going to die in my place for my sin. Paul said it like this in Romans three. He said, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin, that's propitiation. The sacrifice that takes the wrath of God for sin in our place so that you don't have to experience the wrath of God for your sin. Paul says in the new covenant, God presents this new and living and forever permanent sacrifice in Jesus that will forever take away our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and Romans three, it says, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin, the propitiation for our sin. And then watch this, people are made right with God. This is another way of saying made righteous. People are made righteous, they're made right with God. When? When are people made right with God? When they've been good enough? When they're baptized? When they've prayed a prayer? When they've been to church enough times? When they've given enough money? It's none of those. When are people made right with God? When are people made righteous? When they've done better, when they try harder, when they stop trying to do the bad stuff and you leave here and you're, I'm gonna try as hard as I can to be a better person and to do the, the best that I can. It won't cut it. You're not enough. Paul said, we're made right with God. We're made righteous. When? When you believe that Jesus sacrificed his life. When you believe that Jesus was the propitiation for your sin, when he died in your place for your sin and made atonement for your sin. John said it like this in 1 John chapter two. Watch what he said. He said, he himself, Jesus, is the sacrifice that atones. This is the propitiation that atones the wrath of God for your sin. Ephesians two says that by our nature, we're objects of the wrath of God. You're born into sin. You're an enemy of God, Romans five says. And you will experience the wrath of God in hell for your sin unless you believe that Jesus is the sacrifice that atones for your sin and makes you right with God. And not only for your sin, but the sins of all the world. Jesus is the only propitiation for our sin. He's the only one that makes us right with God. And I wonder, If when Thomas saw the nailed, scarred hands of Jesus, if he instantly thought, he's the Lamb of God, like John the Baptist said, this is the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. He died in my place for my sin. Look, he was pierced for my transgressions. This is my Lamb that has died in my place for my sin forever. This is the land that makes me right with God. It says that Thomas believed and he said, my Lord and my God. Thomas saw the hands of Jesus and believed the hands that provided the propitiation for his sin. And listen, some of you are here Today, and you've been thinking that if you're good enough, if you try harder, if you do better, maybe if you've, because you've been baptized or maybe if you get baptized again, or maybe if you take the Lord's Supper again or something like that, that's gonna make you right with God. It doesn't. Paul's very clear. You're made right with God when you believe that Jesus sacrificed his life in your place is the propitiation for your sin, just like Thomas did when he saw those nail scarred hands of Jesus. And so Peter says in 1 Peter 5, come under the hand of God. And this is what he means. 
Humble yourself, come underneath God's mighty hand. And when you do that, here's what you're saying. You're surrendering yourself saying, God, I'm coming under your hand, your plan, your protection, your provision, your propitiation. I'm coming under your hand. And when you do that, when you humble yourself and you come under the mighty hand of God, all your cares and anxieties are cast upon him. It's a byproduct of humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. So here's my big idea. Here's what I want you to see today. It's this, it's that coming under God's hand releases anxiety's pressure. Coming under the hand of God will release the pressure that anxiety has put on you. And when you do this, it doesn't always mean the situation's gonna change, the outcome's gonna change, but it does always mean that something's gonna change in you. It doesn't mean that things are gonna change around you, but something's gonna change inside of you. It doesn't mean that God's gonna remove it, but it does mean that God's gonna help you get through it as you come under his hand and as the pressure of anxiety is released. Now, let's go back to Psalm 46, where we were last week. Psalm 46, 10, in the middle of the chaos and the crumbling, the earth quaking, the psalmist says, be still and know. Be still and know. So my challenge for you today is this. When anxiety attacks, be still and know. When anxiety attacks, be still and know. And we talked about a lot of things that we need to be still and know last week. And here's what I want to challenge you with today. When anxiety attacks, be still and know. Know what? Know this, that you have got the upper hand. No matter what you're going through, the storm that you're facing, how low you may feel, how much you may feel like you're sinking, just like Peter was, you're not yet sunk. You've still got the upper hand if you will reach out and cry out for your Lord Jesus to save you. Would you pray with me? And I know some of you are here, even right now, and you're battling anxiety, you're battling fear, you're battling the, the pressure that you feel under. And if that's you, I just wanna ask you to slip up your hand and say, yep, that's me. I'm battling with some anxiety, some fear, some pressure. It's overwhelming. Hands up all over the place. Just between you and God right now, again, heads bowed, eyes closed, you can put your hands down. But here's what Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter 5. If you continue to read the very next verse, Peter basically says this, remember your family all over the world that's going through exactly the same thing you are. In other words, here's what you need to know this morning, you're not alone. You're not alone. You've got a family, brothers and sisters in Christ here and all around the world that are battling with the same thing you are. You are not alone alone. And Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 1. He said, I was overwhelmed beyond my ability to endure it. And so I began to lean on God. I began to trust in God. And then he said this, we comfort each other with the comfort that we've been given. And so in doing so, we share, actually, we share in each other's sufferings. You see, God has given you a, a family brothers and sisters in Christ to do the Christian life with so that you're not alone, so that you can share your sufferings with them. And so can I tell you this morning, like Brandon said earlier, you need a circle, you need a circle because when you're down, when you're anxious, when you're feeling under pressure, you need a circle that can circle around you and lift you up and encourage you and pray for you and bring comfort into your life. You need that circle, you need your family that God has given you to do this life with so that you can share it. 
You need prayer. You're not alone. You need to go to someone and ask for them to pray for you. We're gonna have prayer teams here in just a second. Go to one of them and ask them to pray for you. They'll be on the sides and the aisles. Say, this is what I'm going through. I need you to pray for me. And you'll have that feeling, I'm not alone. And God will comfort you through the family of God. See, it's no wonder some of us continue to battle with prolonged anxiety and stress and pressure and fear. We're not connected to the family. We've been running from the family. Maybe you would hear God saying to you today, you gotta get in a circle. You gotta circle up with some people so that the we can circle around me and lift me up and encourage me and share in these sufferings. And then here's the second thing I want you to know, just again, this is just between you and God, just continue to pray. I wanna remind you this morning that you've got the upper hand. Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 1, he's overwhelmed beyond his ability to endure it. But then he says, but the Lord Jesus has rescued me from sin and death. And I believe he's gonna rescue me again and again and again and again. Can I tell you this morning, regardless of what you're going through, you've got the upper hand and Jesus is going to rescue you again and again. He's already rescued you and he's going to rescue you again. You've got the upper hand. God, we thank you. God, that you are with us in our times of trouble. And as we saw last week, you wanna hold our hand through it. And as we see this week in your word, you're telling us not only do you want us to hold your hand, you want us to come under your hand, under the mighty hand of God that represents your plan, your great plan, your strong protection, your incredible multiplying provision and the propitiation of Jesus. So God, I pray that today we would humble ourselves. We would come underneath your hand, your mighty hand. And in doing so, God, by the Spirit's power inside of us, releasing all of our cares and anxiety to you, God, because you care for us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Now let's stand, let's worship and sing about our great God because we have got the upper hand.